The consequences of Israel's war on Gaza is causing a maritime crisis in the Red Sea, one that has drawn in major powers like the United States, the UK, and China. So, is the Red Sea becoming fully militarized? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. The Red Sea, it's one of the busiest shipping routes in the world and one that's been a source of contention for some time. Houthi fighters in Yemen have been targeting vessels they say are linked to Israel since the war on Gaza began. They've also recently banned ships from the U.S. and Britain from their surrounding waters. Vessels being rerouted have caused considerable delays and come at a high cost. The U.S. and U.K. have launched several airstrikes against Houthi targets in Yemen in an effort to stop the attacks on ships. They're also launching a multinational force to protect trade, which the EU is now joining. So, is the Red Sea now becoming fully militarized? And should protecting trade outweigh other issues? We'll put that to our guests. First, this report from Malhabe Motsepe. British-owned cargo ship Islander is the latest merchant ship to be targeted by Yemen's Houthi rebels. Just days earlier, another UK-registered ship, the Rubima, was hit. It now stands at risk of sinking in the Gulf of Aden. These strikes in the Red Sea are hurrying efforts to protect the maritime corridor that connects Europe and the Mediterranean to Asia. The European Union has approved the establishment of a defence naval mission to work alongside a US-led coalition. So far, the Pentagon says its operation in the region has been successful in protecting cargo ships sailing through what has become perilous waters. Do some of the missiles get through every now and then? Yes, we've seen that happen. Uh, but for the majority of the time, our, our engagements have been successful, our allies' engagements have been successful, and we know the importance of this waterway. We know that 10 to 15 percent of the world's commerce flows right through here. The U.S. and U.K. have launched several airstrikes against Houthi targets in Yemen. But the Houthis, who insist they are targeting ships linked to Israel, say they won't stop until it ends its months-long war in Gaza. In support of the Palestinian people's just cause and in response to the American-British aggression on our country, the Yemeni Houthi armed forces carried out three qualitative military operations. The first operation was conducted by the missile force and the unmanned aerial vehicles of the Yemeni armed forces targeting Zionist enemies in southern occupied Palestine. Hostilities in the Red Sea are significantly affecting global trade, with European shipping companies feeling the pinch. Ships are being rerouted to avoid the Suez Canal, increasing transit times and costs. But experts are skeptical additional military intervention will deter the Iranian-backed Houthis. The fact that the United States has designated the Houthis as a terrorist organization and the Europeans are coming through with this move at the same time will lead the Houthis to increasingly view the U.S., Britain and Europe all in one block, and it will lead to more attacks on European ships. We also have the Ambry, which is a Greek uh, flag carrier, also finding itself at risk too, uh, just in the past 24 hours. So more attacks are yet to come. The Houthis have previously said they'd reconsider their strategy if more humanitarian aid was allowed into Gaza. But with no ceasefire in sight there, and more countries sending their naval ships to the region, Concerns are growing about the impact of a fully militarized Red Sea. Malikhaba Motsepe, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests in Ankara, Batul Doan Akash. She's a researcher at Ankara University and examines Gulf foreign policy, security stra strategies, and political culture. In Singapore, Stavros Karamperidis, head of the Maritime Transport Research Group at the University of Plymouth, and in London, Fada al-Muslimi, a research fellow with the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Fada, let me start with you today. The U.S. and the U.K. have launched several airstrikes against Houthi targets in Yemen in order to try and stop these attacks on ships. Uh, but the Houthis say that they won't stop their attacks until Israel ends its war on Gaza. Will additional military intervention actually deter the Houthis? Yes, Mohammed, thank you for having me first and foremost. Um, and uh, second, I think uh, overall I share your concern and the report that uh, 
the Red Sea is becoming now red, mostly because of a blood that is about to spill over. And I think uh, there is something we have not yet seen the full consequences of it. Uh, the recent airstrikes by the United States and the United Kingdom obviously have been uh, qualitatively targeted specific Houthi missile areas and other uh, military capabilities. But I have a huge doubt that they will actually uh, be able to actually stop the Houthi attacks on the Red Sea or make a fundamental military, uh, 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 military difference in a country like Yemen. Uh, let's not forget Yemen is 44 times bigger than Lebanon. And obviously the Houthi capabilities have been savvy and they have developed. And uh, it would be extremely naive to think that these uh, new attacks on the Red Sea uh, are basically developed since October 7. They are ready more than anyone thinks actually for the maritime attacks. And I think that we have not seen even half of what they are able uh, to do in that regard. So. Obviously, no, I don't think that uh, will make a, a fundamental difference, nor will the designation of the Houthis as an armed group by the United States. In fact, it will have a, a counterproductive. And I think the big worry right now is what you have is uh, Europe's position in the middle, which is sending also another um, uh, operation, but calling it a, a defense one rather than an attack one. I think that uh, attempt to have a thin line between striking Yemen and protecting international maritime will come into test the next few days. And I think um, it will not be as clean as Europe hopes. Uh, ultimately, at one point, someone will be killed from the Houthis or the other end. And then it will start a new round of eye for eye um, and a, a face for face, most, more or less, from the Houthis end. And I think uh, we are going to see a, a, a pretty bloody days ahead in the Red Sea, unfortunately. Batul, the U.S. and the U.K. are also launching a multinational force to protect trade. Uh, the EU is now going to be joining that as well. From your perspective, does that mean that the Red Sea is now becoming fully militarized? Um, so it's a difficult question because I think the problem here, the embedded problem here, half the Western countries, especially the ones who are heavily using this road for international commerce, couldn't rec recognize the threat from Houthis since 2014-15, they actually paused inside the Yemen. Wasn't this the expectation that Houthis one day are going to uh, threaten the security of international commerce? Uh, and what was what was what, what was the expectation of international uh, I mean countries or public opinion on on the side of Yemen so the, in terms of militarization since it's the high I mean really critical road of trade and since it's at the heart of the world um, commercial road which might affect other roads of the international commerce as well we might see further implications of warfare but as the previous speaker mentioned i don't think this is going to prevent any other attacks from houthis to the red sea because the purpose of attacks is actually get more attention from the international countries as houthis being um more global uh, actor or, or posing themselves as a global actor rather than an actor only working in the Yemen or functioning in Yemen. So uh, this is why mm. even if we have more militarization on the side of Western powers, this is going to mm. bring more militarization on the aspect of Houthis. So this will be a zero-sum game rather than a game which is going to bring further peace to Red Sea. Stavros, I just want to take a step back for a moment to look at the larger picture here. If you could just talk our viewers through the consequences so far that these hostilities are having when it comes to global trade and, and what those, those consequences might be for global trade longer term. Thank you very much for having me, Mohammed. first of all, and thank you very much for the question. Um, <laughs> What we're seeing so far is that we have seen a reduction by 40% of the vessels passing through the Suez Canal. So that means that there are still vessels uh, using the Suez Canal, and that's why you see on a daily kind of basis recently uh, vessels being attacked from Houthis. Um, of course, uh, as uh, the guys earlier on aforementioned, uh, nearly 12% of the global trade is passing through Suez Canal. And of course, having an impact there, you know, we're having a 5% uh, impact in the overall uh, global operations of the maritime sector. 
The thing is that we have to also take a step back and see holistically what is happening. As you may know, uh, the Panama Canal is facing some problems because of the El Nino and is also having a 40% drop in terms of the crossings of the vessels passing through there. So uh, if we see it holistically, yes, the overall systems are having some problems in terms of supply chain. But to be frank, so far, we've seen that they're kind of reacting okay. You know, we're not having something similar to what we have seen in terms of the COVID, for example. Yes, there is some infla inflection in, in the overall freight rates. The freight rates had increased from nearly 1,000 US dollars uh, back pre-Houthis pre, uh, attack to nearly 2,000 US dollars. But that's not catastrophic. If we compare it back to what happened in, back in COVID that we had 5,000 US dollars for containers moving from Asia to Europe, mm. um, I think it's something anticipated. Um, Yes, so I can talk for forever, as you can see, for that. Uh, and it's a slightly complicated problem, you know, talking mm. about the supply chains. Um, it's it's also we have to, to add the issue of insurance. We have to is, uh, add other issues as well. So uh, it's not a very black and white answer. It's kind of a gray area. Let's put it mm. in terms of what kind of impact has into uh, over logistic operations. Betul, I, I saw you reacting to some of what Stavros was saying there, so I want to get your perspective on this as well. I mean, how much damage is all this doing to global trade? How much do these Houthi attacks in the Red Sea jeopardize international commerce right now? So as we know from the records and as the speak previous speaker mentioned, uh, from a broader perspective, um, more than half of the international commerce at the moment uh, have, I mean, redirecting their road from the Red Sea. And the problem here is uh, these, these things can happen. There might be another issue to, to redirect the road. But the problem here in the Red Sea, we don't know how long this is going to take to make sure that Red Sea is safe for international commerce. So the problem here is the uh, is that there is no time limit. We don't know when or how Houthis are going to end their attack. So then how international companies or all these organizations then run, they run this uh, companies, how they are going to ensure the trade. So there's a time problem. The other problem, the scope of the attacks. So we don't know how much the other international countries or regional countries are going to involve uh, with this. Because we know once there is no secure zone in the Red Sea, there will be further problems. There might be further problems in the Horn of Africa or for the other Gulf monarchies who would like to see Yemen in a stable and secure zone. Once we have um, all this is happening in Gaza, it's already unstable in the region. So this is why it's not only the, the time frame, but also the scope and the intensity of the attacks might change the regional dynamics. Fadar, let me ask you, how much of what the Houthis are doing now is about essentially the Houthis wanting to command more attention on the world stage. How much is all of that playing into this? It's definitely their main uh, goal, actually. This is a rare opportunity for them to uh, project power regionally and internationally after they feel they have finished projecting it domestically. Let me add also to what the last two speakers said, that I think there will be few long-term impacts of these attacks. Two of them are domestic and two of them are outside Yemen. Domestically speaking, we have we will have a huge crisis in one of Yemen's most uh, or five of Yemen's strategic uh, goods, which is fishing as an industry. That will have an impact for tens of thousands of families. And obviously, the second part of this will have is an impact of, on the prices of food and insurance to Yemen as a country overall, which is already have been a problem due to the war and many other factors for the last 10 years. Externally, I think what this will do in the long term is it will first um, uh, influence and inspire other groups at the other end of the Horn of Africa in the sense of even criminal gangs, not just ideological groups, but piracy, a lot of other things. And I think the damage there is already done because especially when it comes to maritime security and when it comes to insurance and shipping, first and foremost, it's about perception. And I think the attacks have destroyed that perception in many ways. The other aspect it will have on the long term is, and this is the tough balance to figure right now, is how do you not engage militarily with the Houthis, but also don't let them get away with this? Because there is no guarantee that if they get away with these attacks, that in a few years, whether them or the Iranians or anyone else can do the same with the Red Sea. And then it becomes kind of a hostage bullying card on the long term. That is a problem. And I think the Houthis definitely have 
a lot of domestic uh, motives for it. They have a lot of ideological motives for it. And obviously, if this comes to also help Iran, specifically I, uh, uh, the International Revolutionary Guard, then that's actually um, not another bad idea for them. But first and foremost, this is probably mm. the first opportunity to influence the global trade market and reposition themselves right now, you know, in Wall Street, in London, in Singapore, and everywhere they were not heard of in the past. Stavros, you heard Fadr there talk about the fact that he's saying that the Houthis want to have an impact on the global market, essentially, right now with these attacks. So I want to ask you, because you mentioned global supply chains just a few moments ago in your previous answer, what effect is all this having right now on global supply chains? And, and how much does this ultimately increase the cost for, for shipping companies? And also, when is there the knock-on effect that the consumer will face when it comes to increase in prices? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed, for the question. Just to clarify, you know, in my previous question, that's the one you just asked is about the global supply chains. My, my gut feeling says that for the global supply chains, the impact will be minimal because we see that at the moment that, uh, yes, there is some impact. The freight rates had increased, but we're talking probably for an increase in terms of cost for moving the cargo of 2%. Uh, the, if we come down to regional level, you know, if we start thinking about countries like Egypt or the Mediterranean countries, which approximately approximately host one billion uh, people, then the the impact is bigger because uh, don't forget that uh, you know the North Europe, for example, we're talking about thirty percent diversification. But if we're talking about uh, places like Turkey, as uh, the con panelist is, uh, the diversification is much further for for the containers coming from Asia to Turkey. So. Uh, that adds even further to the overall costs. Uh... If we're talking about the global picture, you know, I'm in Singapore at the moment, 70% of the global trade is in, in their Asia trade. So it's not passing, in other words, through through the Red Sea. But of course, the other 30% has been affected because don't forget, because uh, Panama Canal is facing the same problems. A lot of the cargo that was uh, going for the east coast of the United States mm. is pass, it meant to pass through the Red Sea and now it's passing through the Cape of Good Hope. So that is having another additional impact to the U.S. as well in Canada. Mm. Uh, Batul, um, we know that the Houthis are involved in negotiations with Saudi Arabia to formally end the war in Yemen. Um, from your perspective, do the Houthis believe that these attacks are going to give them more leverage at the negotiating table with Saudi Arabia? Oh, thank you, Mohammed, for bringing this up. So this is an underlining problem now in the regional uh, politics, because we know Houthis are climbing I mean, they, they, they would like to run or rule the wider part of Yemen. So not only the one they rule at the moment, but they would like to go further uh, in Yemen. So to do this and to be the legal force in Yemen, to be internationally recognized, they need to be in a negotiation table diplomatically. And if they have this power in the Red Sea, if they feel like international uh, public opinion is um, seeing them as a new coming force of the Middle East, even if they are recognized as a terrorist organization, this is a branding for, for, them, for them. So this is going to make them more powerful in the negotiation table, because if you ask attacks on Yemen, and if there is more conflict happening in Yemen or in the border of Yemen, in the Red Sea, this is not going to make GCC monarchies happy because they would like to see a stable Yemen. This is why they actually start the military intervention. This is why uh, Mohammed bin Salman initiated all these policies towards Yemen. So this negotiation table is critical for Houthis, first for their domestic position to increase their leverage inside the Yemen as, as, as one of the components of Yemen. Uh, society or political scope at the moment. Secondly, in terms of regional policies, there has been issues between Houthis and Saudis, of course, because they, ha they have uh, they had a war. Um, but also with Iran, although Iran is a supporting partner of uh, of Houthis, mm. Houthis. I mean, the aim of Houthis is not to be a proxy of Iran only. They would like to be a pragmatic uh, ally of Iran, but the purpose is not to be only a proxy. It's more like the legal power of Yemen who is cooperating with Iran. So if they have a, a powerful hand in the negotiation table, this is going to help them towards Iran and, uh, to, I mean, towards Saudi Arabia. So mm. they need a multi-layered source of power to be powerful against two regional hegemony and mm. to, for the sake of their international recognition, of course. 
Fader, uh, the Houthis have said before that they'd reconsider this strategy if more humanitarian aid was allowed into Gaza. I want to ask you if you think that that's a likely scenario and if more humanitarian aid gets into Gaza or if there were to be another ceasefire, which of course doesn't look imminent right now, um, would that stop these attacks? I don't want to get into the F games, but I do genuinely think that the Houthis, when they acted uh, like uh, on this, on, on attacking the Red Sea, they do believe that they are helping Gaza. Whether in a factual world that's a true or no is a different conversation. Um, and obviously with the Houthis, like every other Yemeni side, I think um, the two rules of conflict resolution still applies, which is no one gets to win too much and then everyone's honor gets to be kept. So definitely walking out um, or some sort of an aid to Gaza, obviously also because the Houthis feel they have gotten what they want out of this partially, definitely in my opinion will it change. Because also it will end up being a war against the Yemenis if something in Gaza stops and the Houthis don't stop. There is no rationale they have for that domestically, even among their, the, the eyes of their own supporters. I do think that actually what might also happen or what might can make a difference in the Houthi behavior is if Saudi Arabia actually asks them to stop. Because big part right now of the Houthi math to attack the Red Sea is because they feel they have secured the deal with Saudi Arabia. And no matter what they do or don't do or misdo, they have that deal for, deal for granted and for sure. So Saudi Arabia waiving that would probably make a difference, I think, even before Gaza. However, the entire regional and international response to Yemen, uh, to the Houthis, aside from bombing them like the US and the UK, have been one of two. Either uh, trying to play the game of we told you so, which has been the UAE and the Saudi position toward the West, toward the EU, we told you so, we told you so for 10 years about the Houthis, which is a pretty immature and childish game to say the least. Or it has sorted its own arrangements to stay safe, like the Chinese, the Turks, the Qataris, and others who have done that with the Houthis in a different deals under the table. Or obviously zipping it up and trying to not say anything because of the optics like Jordan and Egypt, and because obviously they don't want to look like they are part of a coalition or doing something while Gaza is mm. under attack. So mm. a variety of reasons have made the region and international either act in a totally fractured way or totally mm. opposing way is absolutely helping the Houthis. And I think that will continue to happen. Anyways, not just on Palestine-Israel issues, but mm -hmm. on so many fronts in the Middle East, I think nothing will remain the same post-October 7. And that applies even to the already fragile peace deal we already have mm -hmm. had with Saudi Arabia and the Houthis. They both have hoped that things will continue, but I doubt that will continue to be the same, even if tomorrow uh, the war in Gaza stops, and mm -hmm. even if tomorrow the Houthis stop their attacks on the Red Sea, we will not be able to go back and do the same arrangement the UN was hoping to do after the Saudis handed them an agreement with the Houthis or prepared an agreement between the Houthis and the other side um, before October 7. Stavros, it looked like you were nodding along to some of what Fadar was saying there. It looked like you wanted to jump in, so I'm going to give you a chance to do that. But I also want to ask you, what would full militarization of the Red Sea look like going forward? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Uh... Uh, to be honest, full militarization of the overall sea, I uh, probably will see convoys going up and down, of course, uh, from having a chat with several maritime security experts that I'm having in, into my group. Uh, that seems to be slightly difficult at the moment, but, you know, as more and more uh, forces are uh, mobilized in the region, maybe that would be probably the case. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know, uh, that could probably add a bit of the complexity because, you know, if you have to have convoys of the vessels going from one point to another, uh, yes, it's going to be faster, but, uh, you know, we have to make a comparison at the end of the day of the overall cost of having convoy system running on one side and having free navigation from the Cape of Good Hope. So, you know, from what I'm hearing from the experts that, we, that you're just interviewing is like... Um, it doesn't seem to be like a nice situation involving from uh, at least for the future. Uh, and of course, you know, I, I don't want to discount, dis discount mm. the fact that, you know, it's a real war zone over there. The insurance premium has increased. So, uh, you know, we have to keep in mind that every time the vessels are passing through the region, they have to pay a lot of money to insurance premiums. Uh, I, 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 
you know, it doesn't seem to be a, a nice way to go forward, considering especially that we have inflation in, uh, mm -hmm. in most of the European countries, and that is not helping the economies to, uh, to boost and to go forward. Mm. Uh, Batul, um, looking at the Red Sea, um, Russia had also shown interest in establishing a naval base at Port Sudan, and in 2021, um, that essentially didn't go through. Um, I want to ask you what else is going on in the area that showcases just how important a route that it is. So uh, the role of, I mean, the, the, the side of international commerce is already, uh, I mean, discussed in this show, but let's let's talk more about on the aspect of military involvement. We know the UAE has military bases on the side of Horn of Africa and on the borders of, I mean, Yemeni uh, seaside. We have, as you mentioned, the involvement on, of Russia or the afford of Russia to be involved with the military presence in, uh, in this side of the world. We have Turkey uh, involvement in the Horn of Africa, in the Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we have Israeli and Chinese involvement there. And we have other inter international countries, especially Western powers, who are partially there with their military prisons or with support of the local actors in terms of providing uh, stability and peace in the region, especially for the Horn of Africa, which is connecting Red Sea with, um, with Yemen. So this is definitely an internationally target uh, for many states to be visible in the politics to make sure that their military uh, relations are good with the local actors to make sure that the area is safe from the terrorism or any act of, um, I mean, further uh, problems or, or conflict. But um, the things going on at the moment is actually mm -hmm. bringing everything of Yemen uh, to the globe. So mm -hmm. we, we knew that there's a war in Yemen. People knew that there's a war in Yemen. They knew that there's food insecurity. More than 10 million people are insecure mm -hmm. with their uh, supply, food supply. But what's happening in the Red Sea right now mm. brought more attention to the Yemen war as well. So although all this is happening and it's really uh, changing the dynamics of maybe international commerce and the mm -hmm. security of Red Sea, I hope this is going to bring further attention for the sake of Yemeni society. Mm. But they are suffering since 2015 or even before, they, they might need, uh, they might get more attention. So there might be further and real actions mm. to end their suffering. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Betul Doan Akash, Savros Karamperidis, and Farah Al Muslimi. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here. Bye for now.